Well, today's message is Hope Arrived, Hope Arrived, from Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to read just a few verses, Luke chapter 2, verses uh, starting with 25. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him, and he revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day the Spirit led him into the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the, lo to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace, as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Father, we thank you. Thank you for this word. We thank you, Lord, for this season as we take the time to thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. God became flesh and lived among us. Thank you, Lord. And I pray now as we turn our attention to your word. Lord, give us ears to hear what you're telling us. Help me to speak your words, your words only. In Jesus' name, amen. Hope. Hope is a wonderful word. Uh, we have the, the Advent, and in the Advent we've got several words. We've got joy, love, uh, peace. Uh, hope is one of those that moves. It's an action word. Hope is something that, that uh, pulls us forward. And uh, it is something that when the times may, uh, or circumstances may try to tell you, oh, this, these are not good times, or you're depressed, or whatever. Hope breaks through. It's like the uh, turning the light on in a dark room, opening up the curtains and seeing what's behind. And so here's this elderly gentleman. He'd been serving the Lord faithfully, and uh, the Spirit of God tells him something. And he has been waiting his whole life for the Word of God to be revealed. He had hope, and hope pulled him. And kept Simeon going day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year. He's an old man. And uh, it's sort of like his departure speech. He's ready to go now. He's seen what he hoped for. Um, I think Simeon represents, to me, whenever I read the story, he represents a, a textbook example of how we can explain Hebrews 11.1. 1. In our... In our uh, regular services here pre-Christmas, we're going through the book of Hebrews. And we spent uh, weeks just on Hebrews 11. And Hebrews 11, 1 started off with, now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. And somehow because of the emphasis always comes on faith, rightfully so, but sometimes it comes at the word, at the expense of the word hope. Hope is such a powerful word, and especially in the definition of faith. And so what I want to do this morning for a few minutes, I want to look at the word hope and what happens when hope arrives. Or how can we um, uh, make sure that, that when hope arrives, that we've hoped in the right thing. Okay? And so Hebrews 11.1 1, uh, gives us that, because we've all had that. We've had uh, long expected hope and anticipation, maybe for for some long-lost relative we haven't seen. And the relative pitches up, and it's like, within a day, oh. <laughs> All right, I was hoping for something else. And uh, we can get sometimes our hope disappoints. But uh, we have to adjust, therefore, what are we hoping in? And what are we hoping for? And make sure that when hope arrives, that we can have the joy and the peace that comes. Now look later on that because Paul summarizes it beautifully in one verse when he's writing to the Romans. So we see here that uh, this Simeon, he had hope and he had hope in the right thing. Now for about 700 years, over 700 years, the nation of Israel has passed on from generation to generation to generation the hope of the Messiah coming. And everybody would have hoped that. Everyone. I mean, the, the religious leader doesn't matter if they're Sadducees or Pharisees or, or uh, right down to the, to the guy who, who basically is illiterate and just would have heard stories. That's one thing they had, hope in the Messiah. But there's something a little bit different that happened with uh, uh, Simeon. Um, he heard and he read 
passages like, as everyone did, Isaiah 9, 6, this hope in this Messiah. Well, here's Isaiah 9, 6, 6 7, and 8. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And on the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom. And that's what they were hoping for for a long time. And for those of you who were with us on Sunday night, as we heard the wonderful choir, the Kuwait Chorale, sing the Handel's Messiah, this has been sung. And uh, it, it is customary that when that particular portion of the Handel's Messiah is sung, uh, that everyone stands. Why? Because um, it is in awe of the Messiah for us, not who will come, but who has come. But for 700 years at that time, they also would have had their songs. They would have sung their own version of Handel's Messiah, waiting for the Messiah to come. But something was different with Simeon and or Simon, and we'll take a look at what the difference was. Let's follow the path of hope. I mean, how do you arrive at hope, right? I mean, hope has to, has to come, no matter what the smallest thing you hope for in life, there has to be something that's behind it. So, if, you know, you're hoping for a promotion, or if you're single, you're hoping to get married, and, and uh, there's all kinds of hope that we have. If you're... Uh, overweight, you're hoping to lose weight. Okay? There's, there's hope. Uh, but what backs the hope? And what drives the hope? Well, let's look at, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Hebrews 11, 1, because it's a fantastic verse that has multiple definitions, uh, or maybe one definition, but from multiple words helps us to, to understand that. Hope comes from faith. And according to Hebrews 11.1, 1, it's the substance of faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. So when we work that thing backwards, hope it comes from the substance of faith. So what is our faith in? What substance do we have? You know, you can talk to someone and they're hoping for a promotion. Well, what's the promotion based on? It must be based on faith. Well, what's the substance of your faith? You're going to do it. So if you come late to work or talk off to the boss, uh, your faith doesn't have much substance. <laughs> the substance of your faith is deteriorating and you probably won't have your hope. So you've got a false hope. But when you have substance that is real, Substance that is strong, substance that is based on something that actually is going to work, your hope is strengthened. Okay? So, hope requires the substance that is going to sustain you to arrive at the faith. And in the Christian definition, we talk about faith. What do we believe in? And what is our faith on? Well, this faith substance comes from and derives from the Word of God. We just don't pick ideas out of the air as Christians and say, oh, I believe this. We, we believe in God based on His Word. And so God's Word sets for us the substance, the tangible stuff that we hang on to so that we have the faith so that we hope in the right direction. Well, let's look at God's Word. What does that, how does God's Word come to us? It, it comes to us in, in two ways. Number one, it comes to us in a written form, and that's what we've got. And this is what Simeon had, okay? Uh, the old man, he had that as well. He would have read Isaiah. He, his parents would have read Isaiah. His grandparents read Isaiah. And for hundreds of generations, they had the written Word of God and were reading from Isaiah and other prophets who prophesied about the coming Messiah. So when he stood there that day, and Mary and Joseph came in with a little baby Jesus to get uh, to, to do the, the ritual practices at the eighth day, he came with a backing of all the prophetic words of God. Now, not only that, in this case, there's another way also to get God's word, and that is the spoken word of God. God speaks. He wrote the Bible back then. He spoke through prophets. And guess what? We still have prophets today. 
And he still speaks. And it's equally the much, as much the word of God today as it was back then. And when he speaks to your heart, that's God speaking. And his word in your heart to you is equally authoritative as it is to the word of God. Why? Because the source is the same. Now, if there's a conflict between the two, <laughs> take what's written. That's common sense. We do that even in our world too, right? You can be at work and there's a contract and you sit around and you talk. What the, the two people who signed the contract, what they say should align with what they've written. And if there's a conflict in what was said, what does everyone do? Pulls out the paper. But you wrote this. You signed this. Okay? Common sense. Common sense. This is the base that we use. But God does speak and he speaks authoritatively. That's what it was with this old man as well. God spoke to him. So how does God speak? In the Old Testament, he speaks through the prophets. And with Simeon here, he spoke through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit spoke to him. It's right there in, in Luke. You can see that there. It, uh, we find that here in verse um, 25. Uh, we'll get to that in, in a minute. Let, let's, let, let me just, before we look at verses 25, 26, and 27, specifically about this aspect, about the Spirit, spoken word of God, which I want to encourage us today on, uh, is something about the genuineness of hope, and for us to put this into practice. The chart I just had for you, let's reverse that now the other way. So let's start with the Bible. We have the scriptures, we've got the Bible, and uh, then from the scriptures, as we read it, uh, God's Holy Spirit reveals things to us. Uh, how we've all done that, right? We've we've read passages, we've read them many times, and all of a sudden you've gone through some life experience, and you read the same passage again, and this time the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, and you get it. You get for you, it's a new insight. The, the scriptures have been there all along, but the Holy Spirit reveals something to you that you've never seen before, and that's why it's important in our daily devotions that we take the time and pray. Uh, uh, our reading of Scripture must coincide with prayer, our prayer life and scripture. And that's why in our church, when we have prayer meetings, you've noticed that the intercessory prayers or the Tuesday prayers or whenever we have the prayer meetings, we base it on the word of God. We read scripture and then we pray. And then we pray and read scripture. Read scripture and pray. You can't separate them because God speaks here. And he speaks to us audibly as well. And he speaks to our spirits. And so we've got, we start uh, with Simeon's life. He had the Bible. He, had, he read that. He understood it. The Holy Spirit comes to him because he saw a sensitive heart and says, I'm going to show you something. You're not going to die until you see Isaiah fulfilled about the Messiah. And he knew that in his heart. And he hung on to that. Okay, and so this comes to Simeon in his life. And what does he do with that? Uh, he then has faith. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. And it says that Simeon hoped for. And he longed for it. And it was based on reality. Again, not wishful thinking. Well, let's make this applicable for us today. Okay, so what do we do with this? Well, we have to go through a similar uh, process, isn't it? What, what is it you're hoping for? Okay, and it might be a thousand different things that we're hoping for. But back up the steps one by one. And this is why we read the scriptures. Because as we read scriptures, we are given hope. We are given insight as, as to the way God works. Uh, so much of the Bible is narrative. It is stories of how God reveals himself to us through the lives of other people. It's not a... It, it, those of you that are joining for Wednesday night, and I just want to encourage you all to join on Wednesday nights uh, for an hour, uh, just to understand and help us understand more and more how to read the scriptures. Very simple. It's not complicated. But how often do we come to it? And we come to the epistles the same way we come to Proverbs or to the Psalms. Well, they're, they're designed differently. Uh, just like a dictionary is designed uh, to do one thing. You can open up a dictionary, pick a Pick the thing you need, get it, close the book, and the dictionary has fulfilled its purpose. It gave you the answer you're looking for, okay? Um, how many times do, do we do that? We open it up, pick a verse, oh, it's good, close the Bible, good, I got my diet. Man, you just got a biscuit. <laughs> There's a T-bone steak in here waiting for you. 
But you've got, to, you've got to look at the context. You've got to work it through. Some passages are like that. Some. For instance, Proverbs. Designed that way. They're designed. Pick and choose. Take a verse here. But so much of it is, is for delving and working into it. And so as we read Scripture, we develop an understanding of who God is and how He works in our lives. And what that does is it increases our faith. And when we have our, our faith increased, the Holy Spirit reveals to us different things. So you and I, as we read the Bible, let's pray for a Holy Spirit revelation. One of the ways that I, for my life, have tangibly shown the revelation of God as He illuminates Scripture to me is that when I read the Scripture... For my devotions, I do it with my pencil crayons beside me and my pen and my ruler. I want to visually see what struck a chord in my heart. Father, what are you saying through these verses? In this paragraph, what's happening? In this, in this chapter, what's happening? In this book, what's happening? And as we begin to delve into it, the Holy Spirit begins to speak to our hearts. And, we, and as we pray and as we read and then read more and pray more and pray more and read more, watch the Holy Spirit begin to speak to you the mysteries of God, the revelations, the things that were once hidden that He wants to reveal to you and draw you closer, you and me, closer to Him. You see, we can, we can live in ignorance or we can live in knowledge. And... Uh, let me not get sidetracked. Come Wednesday nights at 7. We'll talk more about it. So we come now. What is our genuine hope? We've seen it with Simeon. But put your name in here now. Put your name. I have to put my name in here. Where's my faith? What's my faith based on? And then I look at the end result. What am I hoping in? And, and these things are tangible. We can, we can go through this stuff. I, and, and sometimes when we've had hopes smashed as we say, or, or the disappointed. And I begin to analyze and I begin to backtrack. Why was my hope disappointed? I begin to find out there's something wrong with maybe my faith or my understanding or the revelation was wrong or I read the scripture wrong. Something went askew somewhere. And so I just want to encourage us to start with the right foundation, the Word of God. And then listen to the Holy Spirit speak. And this is what Simeon did. You see, when hope arrives, discouragement departs. Amen? Uh, hope, hope is an antidote to dis discouragement. If, if, if anyone is struggling with discouragement or depression, um, hope is the best medicine. But you've got to know how to take it and how to administer it. Uh, here. Hebrews 6, verses 18 and 20. Look at this here. We who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be strongly encouraged. Uh, are you discouraged? There's hope to be encouraged. And here's how you do it. We have, verse 19, this hope as an anchor for the soul. It is firm. It is secure. It enters in the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, our forerunner, has entered on our behalf. Uh, this is powerful. Uh, Jesus, this little baby that was born there in, in Bethlehem, he grew up. He grew up. He ministered. He spoke to people. Revealed God's light to us. And then, when all the hopes, the this, this side uh, or misdirected hopes of the disciples about this kingdom that they thought he was going to set up, they were smashed. Jesus died on the cross. Like, hey, what happened to this kingdom you're going to bring to us? <laughs> they missed the revelation of the Davidic kingdom that was supposed to be set up. God's kingdom, based on Daniel, is a kingdom beyond the things that they see of this world. And so Jesus spent the next 40 days after his resurrection talking with them. You can read this in Acts, in the first few verses, that he spends the next 40 days with them trying to correct their understanding of the kingdom of God. What? Based on Scripture. 
So he interprets the scripture and he helps them. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Do you remember the discussion that happened? They were discouraged. They were, their hopes were shattered. And they're walking down the road. And they're, they're downcast. Literally downcast. And so Jesus comes alongside to them. I haven't got a clue who he is. And he begins to talk to them. And what does it say? It says he starts from the law and the prophets. And he begins to explain to them all over again who the Messiah is and the kingdom that he's going to be bringing. He had to adjust. He went right back to that chart we had. He had to go right back to the beginning, to their base of the Bible, and say, let's read the Bible again. And so Jesus has this Bible study with these two guys on the road to Emmaus. And he adjusts some of their biblical interpretation and understanding of Scripture. And what happens? Lights start coming on. A bit more, a bit more, a bit more. They're so excited. They say, come on in, let's have a meal together. They sit down. They're excited. They're, 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 they're getting a new insight into Scripture. And this is what Scripture does if we're praying. Bible reading becomes exciting. And so they, they're, they've got, they entered into this new Bible study series on this road, and they didn't want to end it. Come eat with us. And so Jesus breaks bread, and their eyes are opened. Right there. And what do they do? They were tired. They, they, were, they were dragging their heels just a few minutes earlier. After this revelation, they bounce up and they've got enough energy to run back to Jerusalem on the spot. That's what hope does. It takes a downcast discouragement with shoulders shrunk and knees bent and head hung. And it makes us stand up straight, puts a new spring into our step and allows us to run. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and shall run and not be weary, shall walk and not faint. And what, is it, what does the prophet say? Teach us, Lord. Teach us to wait. The word wait is not sitting around like waiting for a bus. No. Depend on God. Trust in Him. Come to Him. And that involves reading the Word of God. And this is what Hebrews 6 is talking about. Jesus went into the Holy of Holies. Holy of Holies. The real one. And He is offering to you and to me, a hope that is genuine, secure, and steadfast. And nobody can take that away. <clears throat> the, Spirit's, the Holy Spirit speaks hope. Back to our text. We have a few verses there. Fascinating. <clears throat> this is where it's so important to understand, as we come into this Christmas season, the role of the Holy Spirit. And Luke, when he writes... Um, let, let's keep this in, in mind here about what happened at the time. At the time, the general understanding of the religious leaders, which was then passed on to the majority of the people, said that God doesn't speak anymore. He's given us the prophets, and uh, 400 years ago, the prophets stopped prophesying, okay? which wasn't fully true. Uh, that was just the overall sense. There were prophets throughout that time, as we will see. Uh, shortly. But that was the general flavor. There was generally 400 years of silence. And it's not so much because God stopped speaking, it's because they stopped listening. Okay? And it's true, there were no canonical prophets that we have during that 400 time. But just because the scriptures weren't written doesn't mean that God stopped speaking. God does speak. As he, we just found out, he speaks to this old man, Simeon. Now what happens is that here he was, a devout man, reading the prophets, reading the law, getting close to God, and God speaks to him. Take a look in our, our text we've got in Luke chapter 2. And Luke is a charismatic theologian. He's a Pentecostal theologian. He's going to be talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. And so when Luke, when you start reading within Luke, now again, remember the context. 400 years of relative silence. And all of a sudden Luke starts writing to his friend Theophilus. And all of a sudden the word Holy Spirit, angels, divine manifestations pop up everywhere within the first two chapters of Luke. And anyone who, understanding at that time the context, would sit up and, and listen and go, this is amazing. After all these hundreds of years of silence, all of a sudden the, uh, the voice of God breaks into humanity again. Rather, the humanity listens to the voice of God. And there's a new and a fresh revelation of the speaking of God into their lives. And so it is with this man here who is devout. Look, take a look at verse uh, 25. And what does it say? And the Holy Spirit was upon him. 
Well, that only happened hundreds of years ago with the prophets. And that happened with the, with the great prophets of Elijah and Elisha and, and uh, the others. And here's this man in their time, and it says the Holy Spirit was upon him. Um, it's amazing. Amazing. If that's true back then, pre-Pentecost, how much more today? Amen? Why can't we be that? And that's how we read Scripture. We put ourselves into this and say, I want the voice of God to speak to me today again. And uh, those of us that, that are longing for God, and longing for His voice, you know, and I can testify, many here tonight, to this morning, if we pass the microphone, can testify how God speaks today. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is not only on us, but He's in us. Amen? He doesn't just come upon us to do a job and then depart like He did with the prophets of old, but He comes inside of us and lives inside of us. It's God's Holy Spirit has been promised because Jesus was taken away and He says, when I go, don't worry, a comforter will come. And God's Holy Spirit is in us. Let's allow him to speak. Let's listen to him, what he has to say. Verse 26, it says that he was divinely revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, which means that this old man had to have his ears open, the spiritual ears open to hear the voice of God. If we rush into God's presence and rush out and say, God, I'm busy, I got to run off to work, or I got to do this, I got to do that, um, God will say, okay, all right. When you're ready, I'll talk to you. <laughs> it's up to us. And uh, here was this man. He just took the time for God. And it doesn't mean we neglect our work or our duties. It doesn't mean that. It just means we have hearts that are sensitive to hear the voice of God. And, and to anticipate it and to listen to it. And it's amazing when you slow down in your spirit. Even though your work may continue to push you. But when you slow your spirit down and take time for God. And open our ears to hear. It's amazing how much God is in fact speaking today. He does speak. He speaks through the small still voice. Sometimes he speaks loud. He speaks in many ways. But he is speaking today. Verse 27. And it says here. And he came uh, in, in the spirit into the temple. You know we've got this uh, saying. Uh, especially perhaps more so among uh, charismatics and Pentecostals. About being in the spirit. And sometimes that, that term in the spirit can easily be twisted. And some people think oh yeah those are the people that hang from the chandeliers. Or flip out on the floors. They're in the spirit. No, no. Uh, uh, it's a different story. Uh, in the spirit it basically means you're listening to the voice of God. And here it says here, he was driven to, he, he was prompted by the Holy Spirit that day to go to the temple. <clears throat> we all know what that's like. We do our regular routine day after day after day. We drive the same route or do the same thing. And something in your heart <clears throat> comes and God's Spirit says, today you take this route. Or maybe you walk down the same hallway in the office. God tells you, I want you to take a different staircase or a different elevator or whatever else. And you meet up with someone. You bring them the words of Jesus. No angels. No loud voices or trumpets. What is that? Being led supernaturally. Naturally. Naturally being led supernaturally. As we learn to live in the Holy Spirit. We just learn to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And walk in His ways. And as he did that day, led by the Spirit, or in the Spirit, he came into the temple. And he met Jesus that day. And then he gave that wonderful prophecy. He's, he's happy. It's okay, Lord, now I can come home. <laughs> my, my duty's done. Romans 15, please. Romans 15, very quickly. This passage here is amazing. Uh, Paul summarizes it so well here. He's coming to the end of his book, or the letter to the Romans. And he says here in, in uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 13. It's not on the overhead. It's, it, it, he says, I pray that God, the source of hope. Wow. The source of hope. So when we have our hopes smashed, uh, go back and evaluate the source. 
uh, I can guarantee you it's not from God. It was our own mustering, our own thought pattern. Don't get depressed about that. Just adjust it. Get back to the Word. The source of hope will fill you completely with what? Joy and peace. And this is what the Advent is, isn't it? We've got joy, peace, love, hope. It's all here. It will completely fill you with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is why it's so important to be praying in the Spirit. Because by praying in the Spirit, we keep in track with the Spirit. And it's the Spirit of God that guided the authors to write this to begin with. Whether they were the prophets or the apostles or others who wrote this. They were guided by the Holy Spirit. And so as God guided them to write it, He's asking us to be guided as we read it. And so as we read the Scripture, and this is the section that we're doing on Wednesday nights, how to read the Bible. How to read it. Well, we read it the same way it was written. It was written by the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so we read it with the divine inspiration. And we connect with the author. And when we do that, it guides and it builds a faith in our lives. And from that faith, that springs to and leads to hope. And we can walk through life with hope. You see, so many people face hopelessness. And they're discouraged. And they have, to have rough times. And there's difficult times. And again, just on, uh, after the prayer meeting, uh, the last time we had a prayer meeting here, exiting out, uh, a brother was commenting. He says, he says I, I just can't relate. I can't relate, he says, when people are saying that this COVID time was so tough. He says, this season has been the best season of my life. And I've heard that from many people, despite other losses that may have happened. Why? Because for many, especially Christians, it slowed us down. It's like this global slowdown. Pause. Wait. And we can testify that in our church, the amount of people coming to our prayer meetings has increased. Bible studies have increased. Globally, God was slowing the world down or allowed the world to be slowed down. What did we do? What's our reaction? And some people got depressed, but others who took this slowdown took now the free time because they didn't have to travel back and forth. They had to stay at home. You've actually created free time. What did you do with your free time? And those that took the free time during this last year and a half and invested into the kingdom of God by coming to prayer meetings, coming to Bible studies, they testify all throughout. And I hear it over and over about the goodness and the faithfulness of God, that their faith has increased and hope has increased and hope has given them a new direction and a value. They've used the season correctly. Others have just literally squandered their time and have not invested the time that was freed up for them. And so here we find Simeon here. Now, if it's not just him, let's look at somebody else. And it happens in the verses right after our text. And I don't want to spend much time on this. But in verses, back to Luke chapter 2, verses 30, uh, 36 to 38, here we find Anna, this prophetess. Okay, here she is. Just, just doing the math. How old is she? Anybody? You want to shout it out? Minimum? What's her minimum age? A little higher, a little higher. M minimum wage, minimum age, higher. Okay, she, she would have, at 91, she would have been very young when she married. Okay, suppose she was married at a young age of 13. That's young. So we're putting a minimum. She was married for seven years. Putting her at 20. How long has she, was she a widow? 
that gives us 104. She's not a spring chicken. She's been around 104, at minimum, probably older. Look at her life. Look at the hope that she had. You know, some people have hopes and expectations, and if they don't get them within a short time, they give up. Well, I used to hope for that, but I kind of gave up. Here she is over a century, still hanging on to the hope and the faith that she has. You see, her, her life, and, and, and by the way, this is very interesting uh, because she's, a, she's actually called, identified as a prophetess. Okay? God spoke to her. I know it kind of messes up people's theology about women and the giftings that God gave to them. Okay? Um, relax, it's scripture. Okay? There are prophetesses, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay? Um, church governance is a different matter. Giftings of God are there. God doesn't discriminate. He gives his gifts lavishly to any and to all. And so here's this prophetess. She comes. And the, the exuberance that comes out of, out of her life. And uh, she's just excited. And so she also says then, okay, I'm done. I can go home now. Lived my life. Um, God's got dreams for each one here today. He has them. I, I use a human term, dreams. We're the ones with the dreams. He, he has plans for you, for each one. And as we learn to listen to him, as we read the scriptures, and we hear his voice, he begins to reveal these to you and to me. And so why has God called you to Kuwait? Why has he given you the life's partner you have? Why has he given you the children you have? For children, why has he given you the parents? <laughs> why, why the job that you have? There's a reason for it. And as we listen to the voice of God, he will begin to manifest these things to us. And we'll find out that we can live with joy and with peace and with hope. And it pulls us forward. And we wake up in the morning, not dragging ourselves out of bed, but jumping out of bed, recognizing that this is a new day that God has given. And hope literally pulls us forward. It's this gravity that drags us in, in the right direction. And we can just go flying into it. Don't resist it. Listen to the voice of God. Come with what he has to say. Hope so that when our hopes arrive and we see them, we are filled with joy and anticipation. And we will never be disappointed when the hopes that are birthed from God in our lives, when those hopes arrive, we will be happy and we will be joyous and we will have that peace. And it will be a revelation that when the things that we expected that they'll be great, that they'll be that much greater when the hope arrives. And so what are we hoping for? Uh, what is our hope? What are they based on? And I uh, trust that as we go through this Christmas season, that our hopes are based on Jesus Christ. This little child that grew up, Emmanuel, God with us. If we put our hope in Jesus, we'll never, never be disappointed. Let us stand. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your heart of speaking into our lives. I pray, O oh God, that the hope today that we have, O oh Lord Jesus, when it arrives, when we watch things unfold in front of us, O oh Lord God, that we do nothing else but thank you and praise you for who you are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>